Thankfully, Dr. Richard Bodmer, an Aikido space conservationist, has helped preserve some of the last remaining steamboats. He's turned one into a historic boats museum. This is a Ayapur. Uh -huh. Ayapur was built in uh, Hamburg, Germany in 1906. Uh -huh. What happened during the rubber boom is that the rubber barons had so much money. Every time this boat would go out for one month collecting rubber, it would come back with about $2 million in today's value in its hull. Two million, oh my gosh. And so that's how lucrative it was. So they were able to buy the top of the line boats, the best boats built. None of this could have happened without the steamboat, correct? That's right, okay. none of this. Because the currents of the river are so strong that you couldn't go up river without the steamboats. And when mm -hmm. they first came in the 1850s, Everything changed here. Right. And for the first time, you could have commercial activities in the Amazon. The steamboats built Iquitos. Given the time of year, we have to clamber down to where the Ayapua is beached in the mud. But with the rainy season begun and the Amazon just starting its annual rise of more than 30 feet, it won't be long before the area floods and the Ayapua floats again. This whole helm of the Ayapur was many of its original features. Uh huh. Over here we have a whole steam horn. Every time the Ayapur would come back to port, it would let everybody know that it's full of rubber. And so they'd blow the horn. So please, if you'd like to blow the horn. Give it a go Give here. Give it a go. So here's a little exhibit on the Ayapur. Mm -hmm. You can see how they're loading up oh, yeah. rubber onto the Ayapur. Yes. Those are the rubber balls? That's right. They would weigh about 50 kilograms each. And you'd put them in the hull of the boat because that's where you want the weight. It's much uh, fancier than I expected. I, you know, it's a working boat, right? I expected it to be a little bit more, I don't know, austere or something. Yeah, it has been restored a little bit. And this would have been the area, actually, where they would have kept the wood for the boiler. That's why in the Amazon, you find that towns are very evenly spaced. And those towns are evenly spaced because that was a collection point for the timber. Like getting their gas tanks refilled. That's right. So this whole room would have been filled with timber in order to make it to the next point. You can't run out. That's right. If you run out, uh, that's uh, what you call running out of steam. Yeah. That's there you cool. have it. <laughs> yeah. Lots of working boats ferried rubber to Iquitos and the world beyond, but the really hard work was done by the tappers who collected the rubber out in the jungle. Here we can also see the different utensils used by the rubber tappers. For example, how they cut the trees. Here we have a few small rubber balls. Mm -hmm. Given that the Amazon's indigenous tribes knew the forest better than anyone, many were recruited as rubber tappers. There was cases, and especially on the Putamayo River, where atrocities were discovered against the indigenous people. And it was on the Putamayo where you had the rubber baron Arana. Oh yes, I've heard about him. And there was a Canadian traveler, Hardenberg, who went down the Putumayo. He discovered the employees of Arana who were mistreating indigenous people. And there you can see he's a photograph of indigenous people in shackles when they enslaved them. And he reported whippings and actually burning people alive and killing yeah. people. Did it change anything? Peruvians investigated, and the British investigated because the company was registered on the British stock market. Uh -huh. When they investigated, they had a court case in London. The result of the court case was Julio Rano was found guilty, but he was only fined one penny. Uh, justice not served then. 